You're listening to the African Campfire Stories. The African Campfire Stories is a podcast program that is dedicated to the telling of African history stories and events. Welcome. To bring African history to you, we have to read through a lot of details. Should you pick up anything we get wrong or if you just need to reach out, please use our website www.africancampfirestories.com. You can also reach us on our social media pages on Twitter, African Campfire Stories on Facebook, African Campfire Stories on Instagram, African Campfire Stories and on our website www.africancampfirestories.com. To create this podcast, we use sources created by historians, academics, and other writers. So, thank you very much to all the men and women who write about African history. This is Special Episode 2, the CIA and KGB Comedy of Errors. Please note that this is our second special episode. Our current main series is called Cold War Pawns. Please check that out on our website. So, what are special episodes? We will use special episodes to provide you with additional content. Content that is over and above our normal programming. For instance, right now our normal programming is the Cold War Pawns series. This opportunity to provide you with additional content will allow us the flexibility to cover a variety of history topics, some of which might not have anything to do with African history per se. It will allow us to discuss things such as book reviews for history books, history movies, and things of that nature. We can also use this platform of special episodes to tackle the history behind crucial topics that come up on current affairs media. Today's special episode is still somewhat related to our current main series, as some of the things that we will talk about are related to the Cold War. But other special episodes will not always necessarily be related to our normal programming. We hope that you'll enjoy our special episodes. On this second special episode, we will discuss the follies committed by the USA and the USSR intelligence agencies during the Cold War. The first folly we will talk about concerns the CIA and its performance with regards to the toppling and or the killing of Fidel Castro. As we continue with our Cold War pawns and tackle the African countries, you'll be hearing a lot about the CIA and, I mean a lot, This is because the CIA was used as the main tool for intervening, or as some people will call it, interfering in foreign countries. The CIA's performance when it came to Castro can be described as one long comedy of errors. According to the man who was tasked with protecting Castro for most of the more than 40 years that Castro was in power, the CIA made over 600 attempts, 600 attempts to kill Castro. Of course, this could be a blatant lie. I've been reading a book on Heinrich Himmler recently. Himmler is the guy in Nazi Germany whose primary job was to protect Hitler and Hitler's regime, meaning Himmler ran the police and secret services of the Nazi party and government. The book explains that in a dictatorship, and of course we have to call Castro's regime what it was, it was a dictatorship. In any case, the book says that in a dictatorship, The heads of the police or the protection services have to justify their existence by drumming up imaginary plots. So maybe the story of 600 assassination plots was a self-serving ploy by Castro's protection services. Who knows? Nonetheless, there are many other more reliable sources that enumerate the many plots that the US government employed in trying to get rid of Castro. But you don't even need to believe historians or journalists when it comes to the story. In 1975, the U.S. Senate created a committee chaired by a senator called Frank Church. The committee has thus been labeled the Church Committee. The purpose of this committee was to investigate the increasingly suspicious activities of the CIA. The Church Committee established that the CIA and other U.S. government agencies was secretly being naughty, doing naughty things like assassinations and stuff. Not only that... But this naughtiness was done in such a way that senior leaders in the government could deny ever knowing or being involved with it. If you don't believe the U.S. Senate investigation on the CIA, then what about this? In 2007, CIA documents were declassified that showed the following. 
One, the CIA had not used one, but three mafia bosses in trying to kill Castro. Two, one of those mafia bosses was on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. So the CIA was in bed with serious criminals that their own country was trying to lock up. Three, the mafia was supposed to poison Castro's food and drinks. Four, several of these mafia attempts were made and failed. Because intelligence agencies have to have code names for almost everything they do, these declassified CIA documents are codenamed the Family Jewels. When you read about some of the plots from these documents, you wonder if the CIA was watching too many spy movies. It makes you wonder how on earth did the USA manage to win the Cold War, when one of their main tools for fighting the Cold War, that is the CIA, was sometimes so incompetent. The first ever James Bond 007 movie came out in 1962. The second one came out in 1963. The third one came out in 1964. And a lot of plots to kill Castro were carried out in the 1960s as the James Bond movies were first coming out. Were these CIA people watching James Bond movies? Of course I'm saying all of this in jest, but judge for yourself. Here are some of the crazier CIA plots. 1. Inserting explosives into Castro's cigars so that he could literally smoke himself out. 2. Using a poison syringe disguised as a pen. 3. Gassing a radio station Castro was to appear in with the drug LSD. This wasn't even meant to kill Castro. It was supposed to get him high, so high that he would appear crazy and deranged to the Cuban people. <laughs> really? CIA, getting your enemies high on LSD? I mean, come on. Do yourself a favor. If you ever get a chance, check out the documentary called 638 Ways to Kill Castro. Maybe you might get it or at least some excerpts from it on YouTube. Although what we are saying about the CIA here might be funny, do not think that the CIA's record in the African leg of the Cold War is going to be this incompetent. So now that we've had some fun with the CIA... What about the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics Intelligence Follies? Are there any? Oh yes. Maybe the most well-known Cold War comedy on the side of the USSR was the event in 1983 when the world as we know it nearly came to an end. In September 1983, in a bunker near Moscow, Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov saved the world as we know it. What happened? Well... Since the USA and the USSR suffered from mutual paranoia, they set up what was called early warning systems to detect nuclear attacks. These systems used satellites and other technology to provide warning in case nuclear war between two superpowers was initiated. Petrov was on shift one day in September 1983. When the system warned him that the USA was launching a missile in the direction of the USSR, Yes, only one missile. This should have been strange to anyone concerned because neither the USSR nor the USA was going to launch nuclear war by shooting off one missile. At this time, both countries understood that if nuclear war came, they would have to go for broke and shoot off their entire arsenal. Petrov is a hero here because when the system warned him that the USSR was under attack by the USA, he figured this to be an error. It turned out that Petrov's suspicion that the system was malfunctioning were actually correct. Thus, World War III was averted. But this story is not over yet. Later on, the system malfunctioned again. This time, the system picked up four missiles headed for the USSR. Again, Petrov suspected that the system was in error. And again, the man saved the world. But the USSR during its existence and even modern-day Russia do not see Petrov as a hero. To them, these errors on their systems were proof that the USSR systems were not all that kosher after all. So, he is an embarrassment over there. Petrov is a hero only to the West, for the most part. Oleg Kalugin, a former chief of foreign intelligence in the KGB, has said that had Petrov confirmed these fake missile warnings as true... 
the USSR leadership was so paranoid that they would have launched what they would have thought to be a retaliatory attack. Kalugin says, open quote, the danger was in the USSR leadership thinking that Americans may attack, so we better attack first, close quote. The KGB, by the way, was the USSR's version of the CIA. Don't think, however, that the USSR had a monopoly on manufacturing systems during the Cold War. In November 1979, the world as we know it nearly came to an end when the warning system in Colorado mistakenly showed that America was under attack by a lot of missiles. The US president was told to evacuate, not just using a normal airplane, but to evacuate using what was finally nicknamed the Doomsday Plane, and missiles were prepared for retaliation. These two incidents, both in the 1983 USSR false alarm and the 1979 US alarm, could have brought about a nuclear holocaust to our planet. The last such incident we will talk about was a game. We have spoken about NATO in our Cold War Pawns series. NATO stands for North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It was basically ran by the US, even though it was supposed to protect Europe against the USSR. It did and still does consist of European countries as members. In any case, in November 1983, there occurred another scary incident. NATO was conducting a war game called Able Archer 83. War games having nothing to do with PlayStation or Xbox. War games are when militaries pretend as if they're fighting in a real war. They are therefore part of military training and preparedness. And they work best if they are as realistic as possible. <laughs> To simulate Able Archer 83, NATO made things super realistic. This confused the USSR. They knew that this game had been planned for a long time. But what if the USA was using this war game simulation to cover the real thing? What if the USA was fooling the USSR and pretending that they were playing a war game when in fact they were really attacking? So the USSR prepared for retaliation and they stayed on high alert until the war games were over. But this information was only found out later by the USA. The USA didn't know at the time that their war game nearly caused a real nuclear war. This is some scary stuff, people. We've already stated above that police in dictatorships tend to exaggerate the danger faced by the leadership and the country. The KGB was very good at that. The KGB overestimated its contacts and secret intelligence operations in order to impress the leaders of the USSR. In such situations, the leaders of any country will have a problem establishing if their intelligence services are lying to them. Except, of course, in the few cases where the intelligence people are found out. Cases where intelligence and reality do not match. As happened with the 2003 US invasions of Iraq. But such cases where intelligence can be tested against reality are few and far in between. So intelligence services can lie to their heart's content. Things were even more confusing when KGB agents defected to the USA or Britain and handed over what they claimed to be valuable intelligence about the KGB and the USSR to the CIA, only to later have other KGB agents defect. <laughs> and the first thing they do when they get to the West is to tell the CIA that the information they got from the previous defectors was incorrect. Nope, they would say. This information that you got from Vlad is incorrect. It is my information that is correct. And since all this information is secret and highly confidential, who knows what is correct and what isn't? In the Cold War series, we state that the USA has freedom of information laws that can afford us to look into secret intelligence operations. The USSR no longer exists, so their records would have to be released by present-day Russia. <laughs> Good luck with that. So to learn about the USSR secret follies, we usually rely on former USSR intelligence workers who have defected to the West. In 1992, a KGB defector went to the US Embassy in Riga, Latvia. He wanted to defect to the US, and of course, in the intelligence world, if you want to defect, it helps if you are willing to betray your country's secrets. In fact, there is very little chance of being accepted as a defector if you will not be selling out your country. Vasily Mitrokin was an old dog in the intelligence world, so he understood this very well. 
he had pages upon pages of secret information. Unfortunately, Vasily had to go defect to the British instead of the Americans. Why the change of heart? Because the queue in the US Embassy was too long. This is the actual reason he gave. This must be the very first instance I have come across in my long study of history where a long queue has affected the outcome of historical events. When he got to the British Embassy, the first question he was asked was, Would you like a cup of tea? It doesn't get more British than that. These are the types of people that one should defect to, <laughs> Vasily must have thought to himself. Vasily's documents showed some of the more unique KGB operations. For instance, in the 1960s, the KGB paid an editor of the weekly Tribune newspaper £200 to publish USSR propaganda on the newspaper as news. Hmm. This must make you wonder about some of today's news outlets, as Donald Trump would say, fake news indeed. But when this story first came out, the Tribune editor in question responded to this story by saying that the KGB agent was lying. Maybe the KGB agent who made up this story about him just wanted Moscow to give him, the KGB agent, a bigger allowance of an additional £200, so the editor said. But who should we believe here? That is the challenge of dealing with secret intelligence. The KGB files also contain information about two British men who were spying for the KGB. What is funny about these two men is that the KGB files state how in love with alcohol these two men were. One guy is described as being constantly under the influence of alcohol. The other guy is described as being constantly drunk and not very good at keeping secrets. And he told his lover and his brother about his secret work for the KGB. But the KGB continued to work with this constantly drunk guy who couldn't keep secrets. Which makes you wonder whether the KGB agents handling this fellow were not more drunk than he was. Isn't one of the key requirements of doing secret spy work the ability to keep secrets? The KGB secret documents reveal an obsession with the media. Over and above paying an editor of the Tribune, the KGB also infiltrated a US magazine called Ramparts. Also, when there was an anti-USSR revolt in Czechoslovakia in the 1960s, the KGB's list of troublesome Czechs to be assassinated consisted of many newspaper magazine editors. ISIS and Al-Qaeda must have gotten their ideas of killing newspaper and magazine staff from the KGB. Last but not least, the secret KGB files reveal that the KGB was spying on the sermons of a Polish cardinal. A cardinal is a senior priest in the Catholic religion. How does one spy on sermons? And oh, the name of the Polish cardinal that the KGB was spying on was Cardinal Wojciech Tyler. Sorry for my very horrible pronunciation of Wojciech Tyler. In any case, the world knows this cardinal better under the name he took on when he later became Pope. The KGB was spying on Pope John Paul II. This is all the time we have for today. We've reached the end of today's episode of the African Campfire Stories podcast. Catch us next time.